Chris Handley coming to you with 100,000 watts of pure healing, miracle working love. I want to talk to you today about Israel and the Nimrod effect, or rather, Babylon to New Babylon. I want to give you a description of what we're going to talk about. Israel and the Jewish people have suffered much at the hands of history. However, what most people, especially politicians and world leaders, do not realize is that there's a dark force behind the causation of these degrading elements. In this teaching, we will expose not only the past stratagem of Israel's enemy, but also the present and future plots assigned to further deceive, harm, and ensnare God's chosen people. But hang on, we will furnish proof revealing the age-old truth, what my mother used to say, that it's how you finish that counts. So let's talk about Israel and the Nimrod effect, or Babylon to New Babylon. The scripture tells us in Torah in Breshith, or Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 to 9, Cush fathered Nimrod, who was the first powerful ruler on earth. Like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, or literally, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter against Adonai. And in Jeremiah 51, 24, and I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion in your sight, says the Lord. And in Revelation, in the Brit Hadashah, the uh, New Testament, Revelation 17, verse 5, on her forehead was written a name with a hidden meaning, Babylon the Great, the mother of whores or harlots, and of the obscenities of the earth. Daniel and the three Hebrew children are examples of deliverance for God's people. More particularly, Mordecai and Esther, the Jewish heroine Hadassah, through their prayers, fasting, and action, kept the Jews from being exterminated by Haman in 127 provinces from India all the way to Ethiopia. However, recall the mass pillage and murders done to the Jewish people under the Roman Titus and his armies who were mostly conscripts and enlistees from Islamic areas. That was in 70, the Christian era. And that's not even accounting for the genocide of 6 million Jews under the rule of Hitler in Nazi Germany. Satan tried many times to exterminate the Jewish people. Why? First, because he did not want the Mashiach of Israel to be born. Therefore, he attempted to destroy the seed line of the Jewish people, and thereby cut off the family line from which it was prophesied that Messiah would come. We read in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 7, Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she gave birth to a boy. And secondly, why Satan tries to attempt the Jewish people even now? Because after Messiah was born, Satan did not or does not want the Mashiach to return a second time to deliver Israel from her future travail in the time of Jacob's trouble and establish his kingdom. In Isaiah chapter 66, verse 8, we read, Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be brought forth all at once? As soon as Zion travailed, she also brought forth her sons. Notice, not one son, but many sons, plural. And notice that happens when Zion travails. We'll discuss that in a moment. However, let's look at three specific historical events designed by the enemy of Israel. Number one, the enemy tried to destroy the Hebrew boys in Moses' day under Pharaoh. Number two, the enemy tried to destroy all the Hebrews in Esther's day under Haman. Number three, the enemy tried to destroy the Hebrew boys in Yeshua's day in Jesus' day under Herod. And notice, Satan will try again to destroy the Jews. He does not want Messiah to return the second time. Why? Because Messiah will establish his kingdom on earth. In Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8, we read an amazing prophecy. It will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two-thirds of the people living there will die, in other words, living in Israel. But a third will survive who live there. That shows that 67%, two-thirds of the Jewish people in Israel will die in the land of Israel in the future. Only one-third, or 33%, will survive who live there. Now let's look at a quick historical background of the Jews and or Hebrews and follow the evolution of the etymology of the names. 
And while doing that, we will see what's happening today and what will happen in the future. The name Jew was first used to refer to someone from the tribe of Judah. Later, after the return from the 70-year captivity in Babylon, in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, the name Jew was used to refer to anyone from any of the 12 tribes. However, the tribe of Judah seemed to make up the larger portion of the remnant of Israel. The children of Israel were originally called Hebrews. Concerning the term Hebrew, it's interesting that after the children of Israel finished wandering for 40 years, and before they passed over the Jordan River into the Promised Land, they lodged for three days at the brink of the Jordan River. Joshua, their leader after Moshe, sent officers through the camp who commanded the people as, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and the ark, about 2,000 cubits. That's the same as about 1,000 yards, or 914 meters, by measure. Do not come near the ark, so that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. You can read that in the Tanakh, in Sefer Yehoshua, or the book of Joshua. The Hebrew root word for past, used in that passage, is abar, ava, which means to pass over, go through pass beyond, and to make a transition, figuratively or literally. My friend, to arrive inside your own personal promised land, you will have to go through a transition. The Hebrew word avar also means to pass from one side to the other. Interestingly enough, a derivative of the word avar is ivri, and ivri means Hebrew. It is the ethnic description of Abraham and his seed line, who was a descendant of Aver the great-grandson of Noah's son Shem. In Genesis chapter 14, 13, or in the Breshith, it talks about Abram the Hebrew. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 16, or Shemot, it mentions the Lord God of the Hebrews. Here Hebrews represents a tribe of Semites, sons of Shem. Remember that Abraham crossed over the Euphrates River from Haran to Canaan, the land God promised him. How did he do it? Through obedience. Abraham, with his wife Sarah and his nephew Lot, had originally left Ur of the Chaldees with his father Terah, and they arrived in Haran. It's possible that the Lord had wanted Terah to take the trip of faith from Haran, and he may not have obeyed. Possibly that's why God chose Abraham. Now, let's fast forward. The extended war in Iraq played, and will continue for a while, to play an important part in end-time prophecy. Number one, for Israel. Number two, for the Middle East. And number three, for the West, including the United States. The result will be a paradigm shift in world commerce, geopolitics, and religion. Plus, Israel will be swept up in a vortex of persecution. But wait, with the president of the USA, Donald Trump, declaring Jerusalem as the undisputed capital of Israel, and with observed synergistic economic prosperity of those who agree, An emotional brain twist will result in Islamic nations, jealousy, and attention. Now let's reflect on something. What politicians, educators, and the news media do not realize, rather do not understand, is that President Trump is anointed by God to help Israel. That's why in just one year, the economy of the USA has surged. Corporations investing in development, plus investing in training employees, unexpected bonuses to employees, Corporations returning to the USA from abroad. Stock markets soaring to new highs. Dead people do not understand life. And so unbelievers do not understand nor comprehend the anointing. What it is, why it is imparted, and from where it originates. Donald Trump, in his office of president, is anointed as much as Cyrus was who commanded Jerusalem to be rebuilt and the foundations of the temple to be laid. Cyrus was a pagan ruler. Isaiah refers to pagan Cyrus as the Lord's anointed. You can read in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28 through 45, verse 7. This prophecy, plus God calling Cyrus by name, was 150 years before it actually happened. Now remember in the Torah, God promised, I will bless those who bless Israel. You can read that several places in Breshith or the Genesis. Even Middle East Islamic countries could be blessed if they were to wake up and work with Israel or helping Israel. Think about it. Don't forget, though, Ezekiel tells us that in the future, Iran will, with Turkey, Russia, Northeast Africa, 
and neighboring Islamic countries attack Israel and be wiped out by God. Let me repeat, there will be a paradigm shift in world commerce and religion. Plus, Israel will be swept up in a vortex of great blessing with persecution. Israel's prosperity will be a thorn in the sides of her Islamic neighbors. But wait, remember what Isaiah tells us will happen in the future. For Adonai has blessed him. Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, which is Syria and Iraq, the work of my hands, and Israel, my heritage. Let me read that again. Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my heritage. Right now, Iraq plays a key piece, not only in the Middle East, with the tug of war between Iran and the West, but in the prophetic puzzle and the timeline of the world. Babylon in the land of Shinar was the headquarters of the first world autocrat. His name was Nimrod. Scripture in the original Hebrew language, and also supported by rabbis, shows that Nimrod was a mighty hunter against, or in opposition to, the Lord. Concerning Nimrod, you can see in the Torah, or Breshith, Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 and 9. Now, just as Babylon was the headquarters for the first world dictator, Nimrod, so the new Babylon will be the headquarters of the new Nimrod, the final new global governance dictator, a despot and worse than tyrant. The new global governance leader will be chosen by the New World Order, or whatever name the organization ascribes to itself at that time, he will be the false Mashiach, the false Messiah, and the greatest enemy that Israel and the Jewish people have ever known. Turkey will probably become the headquarters for the new global governance. In due time, it will become obvious that it will in effect be the clandestine headquarters of the NIO, the new Islamic order. As the global governance center, Turkey will come into position. It may break away from its previous European and Western associations, and as the eastern leg of the old Roman Empire, it will be the epicenter of Islamic geopolitical and financial concourse, fostering the development of New Babylon, international, commercial, political, and religious center of the world. Let me repeat that. New Babylon, international, commercial, political, and religious center of the world. New Babylon will work in alignment for a season with the new global governance leader, the false Mashiach or popularly called the Antichrist, the false Mashiach, the false Messiah. Check this out. New Babylon will later be destroyed by a confederacy of ten regional leaders who actually support her development at first and who align themselves with the dictates of the new governance leader, the false Messiah. Now let me give you a takeaway. Israel's leaders must pray for discernment and insight in the coming commercial, geopolitical, and religious shifts. Watch Turkey. Watch the UN and its evolution transition into the new world governance. And watch for the new Nimrod, a man of supposed peace who will appear on the world stage. This new Nimrod will broker a seven-year peace agreement, a covenant just like Daniel prophesied. In the middle of the seven years, he, the false Mashiach, will go into the newly built temple of the Jews and declare that he is God. The overspreading of abomination just like Daniel prophesied, plus an antitype of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who desecrated the temple around 167 BCE, before the Christian era. Antiochus Epiphanes is a tyrannical figure in Jewish history and he's also a foreshadowing of the coming Antichrist. The prophet Daniel predicts an atrocity in the temple in the end times. Daniel 9.27, chapter 11.31, chapter 12, verse 11. A prophecy concerning a coming ruler who will cause the offerings to cease in the temple and set up an abomination that causes desolation. What Antiochus IV did in the past certainly qualifies as an abomination. However, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus, speaks of Daniel's prophecy as having a still future fulfillment. Read in Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 and 16, Mark chapter 13, verse 14, Luke chapter 21, verses 20 and 21. The false Mashiach, the Antichrist, the new Nimrod, will model Antiochus Epiphanes in his great pride, blasphemous actions, and hatred of the Jews. Now, after the false Mashiach, the new Nimrod, 
the coming global governance leader, goes into the temple and desecrates it and declares that he's God. After that, in the remaining 42 months of the seven-year covenant, will be the time of Jacob's trouble. Read in Tanakh in the Bible in Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 6 to 7. It will be the worst time for the Jewish people and the believing Gentiles that they have ever known. Mega worse than Nazi Holocaust under Nazi Germany. But the good news, Israel will be saved out of it. In Jeremiah 30, verse 17, For I will restore your health, and I will heal you of your wounds, says Adonai, because they called you an outcast, Zion, with no one who cares about her. Now, with Israel's great prosperity and ascendancy through technology, natural resources, and humanitarian efforts, plus with the wealth of the Goyim, the nations coming into Israel, there will come great persecution again that will result in the combined armed forces of the new global governance plus the Islamic enemies of Israel all against Jerusalem. Then, in a nanosecond, the real Mashiach, Messiah, will come from heaven to the Mount of Olives and bring the final deliverance and victory to believing Jews in Israel. Be ready. Put your faith in him. You can know the Mashiach today. And make sure you do before the real birth pains come to pass from travail in the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 33.3 tells us, Call out to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and hidden things of which you are unaware. And Eshuahu, or Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 18. Come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. My friend, I came to know the Mashiach of Israel reading that verse one night alone in my room. I'm going to read it again to you. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. My friend, I've included two resources in the show notes of this podcast to help you not only to develop knowledge prophetically, but to develop your discernment spiritually. One of them is my book, Babylon the Bitch, Enemy of Israel. The other one is my book, Enhance Humans, Mystery Matrix. You will find increased knowledge in those books of not only what's happening today, but what will happen in the future. And God will bless you with extreme discernment and insight into obscure events, geopolitically, religiously, spiritually, and economically. This is your friend. Prince Handley coming to you with 100,000 watts of pure healing, miracle-working love. Baruch Abba Adonai.